You're listening to The Mental Money Podcast, the show that shows you how to master your mind to maximize your money. This show is for people who love to watch their bank accounts grow while shifting their relationship to money. Without further ado, let's get these insider insights from today's leading expert. Awesome. So hello, good morning, everyone. This is Natalie. You're listening to The Mental Money Podcast. And today we have with us Jose Reyes. Um, We will be speaking about angel investing. We've had a number of requests about um, angel investing, investing, funding, and this month just happens to be our funding month. So I thought it was just appropriate to speak with a professional about just that. So Jose, thank you for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. So let's jump right in because I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. (laughs) And we had some questions that came in about investing, but I also had a couple of questions that I think will help guide newer entrepreneurs on the journey to being funded, right? Um, First and foremost, you are a Brown University graduate, alumni, right? Majoring in business economics. And you also spent some time as an investment banker and now moving more into entrepreneurship. Could you tell me a little bit about what skills as an investment banker you had that kind of transferred into becoming an entrepreneur and how do they serve you now? Definitely. Yeah, investment banking, uh, you know, from a pure, just from the most basic level is uh, helping businesses, helping companies either raise capital, uh, whether that's through equity or debt or Mm -hmm. uh, acquiring uh, either full companies or portfolios of companies, uh, which Mm -hmm. is called merger acquisitions. And so the the one fundamental tool for any of those processes is understanding the valuation uh, of the entity of the company. And so that's directly relatable to investing, you know, when you're going to make um, a venture capital investment or an angel investment uh, into a startup, it's important to have an understanding of the valuation, uh, you know, what price you're paying for the investment. So uh, that was probably the most important uh, skill learned from investment banking that transferred to investing. Um, Other skills also that were important were uh, financial modeling, Mm -hmm. uh, being to, you know, to model out a company's financial statements uh, and see, you know, how, how is how, what's happening to cash, uh, you know, what's what's happening to revenue and all the different line items and understanding how they all uh, work in conjunction with each other so that mm-hmm. you can analyze uh, the business um, from a high level. So that was important. And then, you know, just dealing with uh, with clients and investment banking, uh, you know, you're always on the road trying to, to network and, and, and meet new, new clients that you could help either raise capital or help sell themselves or, or buy other uh, companies. So you know, that's directly relatable to investing as well. You, know, you need to understand how to, to network within the, the financial jungle to, to find the investment opportunities that you, you want to uh, invest in. Right. No, that makes sense. And you know, it's, it, you've mentioned two really key points that I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't even know going into entrepreneurship because I feel like a lot of the women, especially that we work with, are these are very much passion projects for them that they want to be able to make profitable for them, right? But a lot of them don't know going in if you are going to be trying to get funding, you need to position your business in a way where you actually have those things in place where someone like yourself or people in your network can look at this business and say, you know, this is a, this is a good model. You guys have your cash flow. There is cash flow, right? Um, you understand what your projections are, like those, those kind of pieces, or maybe one day there might, you might be acquired. So positioning yourself for that, right? So for the newer entrepreneur, what are some considerations that they should make before they even Think about articles of incorporation or like the bureaucracy and paperwork. If they want to be funded, how should they be framing their mind? Definitely. Well, I think the most important and, and the, the the perfect starting point is, is really, you know, what problem are, are you trying to solve? Um, mm-hmm. You need to really be able to articulate that problem uh, within, you know, like the elevator pitch within 30, 40 seconds. It needs to be tight, concise, and it has to be easily digestible by people who may not even be uh, people who work uh, or are familiar with the industry that you're working in. So, you know, oftentimes uh, you'll be approaching a wide range of, of angels. And like I said, they're, they're, they're most likely not going to have experience in, in your specific sector or industry. So being able to uh, 
relay what that problem is um, in a very simplified manner where anyone could could digest it uh, is definitely the most important. Mm -hmm. Right. No, that makes sense. So let's backtrack a little bit. Maybe if we understood what angel investors actually do, then we might be able to kind of like better understand how to communicate and articulate that. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're an angel investor. I'm a startup company and I'm looking for funding. How do I approach you knowing what you do as a business other than as an entity other than help fund companies? Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, the probably the most important way to contact an angel is definitely through someone, you know, you're going to if you're a startup founder, that's that's kicking off a raise. Uh, you know, traditionally, that's why they call the first round friends and family. That's where you're going to get the best. And so where you're going to get the most success from angels is uh, are angels that have within, you know, one to three degrees separation of your network, your friends and family. And what you'd ideally want is an introduction via someone in your network to that said angel. Mm -hmm. um, I say that because, uh, you know, the, at, at the pre-seed seed level, where oftentimes it, it's still, the, the company could still be pre-revenue um, or you're still in beta uh, or you, you haven't really given uh, any historical basis that uh, this company is going to succeed. So it's easier to raise from people uh, that have been introduced to you from someone that is trusted in your network, because then it's easier for that angel to generate trust with you, right? right. Uh, think of it this way. If you're approaching uh, an angel that you don't know, uh, you know, not only do you have to convince them that uh, this company, that this this problem you're solving is is massive, and that you're going to be able to do it properly, but you also have to convince them that you're a person that should be trusted, right. and you really you're able to skip that step if you were given a direct uh, introduction uh, to said angel. So, yeah, really, uh, you know, most of the deals I look at as an angel are are from uh, people within my network uh, because I, I trust these people. And I've, I've either done deals with them in the past or I've worked with them in the past um, or I understand you know, the strategy or what they're trying to do at a high level. Uh, when I see deals from you know, LinkedIn, if someone just randomly DMs me uh, or, or reaches out or I get a, a cold email from someone, I don't even really look at those or, or, mm -hmm. or respond because, again, I just don't, I, I don't have the time to try to build that trust or rapport with the founder and then do the, the due diligence on the opportunity. So it's a lot easier to, for my, in my job to, to pull tr the trigger on investments where I've been introduced to the, to the person. So that's what I would recommend to founders is definitely look within your network first and see uh, what angels exist there and who you could be plugged in with. Uh, and that's where you'll have your most success with angels. Okay. Is it as simple as just asking like, hey, do you know an angel investor you can connect me with? Yeah, yeah. You're going to, I mean, obviously if the person, if the person is an investor, they're going to have some people in their network uh, that, that do that kind of uh, investing. Um, if you don't have people in your network, there's a lot of different avenues where you can build that network. Um, there's a lot of accelerators that uh, help startups raise capital um, if they don't have that kind of network that I'm talking about. Uh, you know, you, the, the YCs, uh, 500 startups, tech stars, uh, Antler, to name a few. And those accelerators are always looking to increase their investor network. So they're always looking for angels to come that, that they would share deal flow with. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one way. Uh, another way would just be following um, certain websites that specialize on startups. You know, there's AngelList, uh, TechCrunch. Uh, you know, if you see a, an article on TechCrunch of a company that recently just raised or, or is looking to raise, uh, if they're featured in tech, uh, TechCrunch, that's usually, uh, you know, a good opportunity. You know, you could just go out and reach out directly to those founders. Uh, and if a founder is raising capital, um, you probably have a good probability of that founder responding to you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, one of my deals uh, that I invested in, um, I just happened to see on a, a crowdfunding site. So mm -hmm. the crowdfunding sites are also a good place to, to see uh, who's raising, uh, you know, you have Seed Invest, uh, Republic, uh, WeFunder, uh, to name a few of those. And I, I saw a deal that I, I liked and I just reached out to the founder on LinkedIn. Um, and because he was raising, you know, he was looking for, for more capital. And so he responded, we built a relationship and, and we took it from there. 
So yeah, there's lots of avenues if you don't have that network uh, of investors that can show you opportunities. It just takes some time. Um, it's not hard. Like I said, they're, they're the, those platforms are all over the place. You just need to go to the right platforms and and network with, with the gatekeepers there. Mm-hmm. So if I'm understanding the strategy is more so like putting yourself out as someone who's looking for funding and then like kind of letting the angels find you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, if if you're you're solving a, a really big problem and uh, if you have good traction, in, investors will find you. You know, mm-hmm. the best deals out in the marketplace have no shortage of funds and angels approaching them to invest them. You know, if, if someone gets an investment from a Sequoia or an Andreessen, Mm -hmm. they're not going to have a problem raising capital. You know, usually all those VCs have other co-investors that invest with them on a regular basis. So you'll get introduced to them. Um, Mm -hmm. And then all those VCs have individual investors as well that, you know, they they could plug you in with. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I definitely market that, that you are raising if you believe you have the traction and, uh, and you're solving a really big problem. Okay. So with that being said, <laughs> we talked about that a little bit last night on our live Q&A um, as far as like just making sure that you you understand what problem you're solving and who you're solving it for. Um, what is a good problem to solve? How would you frame that? I mean, I know it's, in, it's an individual endeavor, granted, right? This is your business. You kind of have to know how to do that. But for someone who's an angel investor, like you, you mentioned earlier, you don't really respond to cold emails. What would get your attention? Uh, from a cold, I mean, from cold okay. outreach. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, obviously the, the problem, if, if the problem is something that people face uh, on a daily basis, or if not daily, definitely on a regular continual basis, that's, that's something that you know is a big problem, right? Because it's something yeah. that everybody out there is dealing with uh, regularly. Uh, problems that, you know, not everyone deals with and, and things that are not on a regular reoccurring basis, those are probably just you uh, would expect those to be smaller uh, opportunities, right? Yeah. But just because of the opportunity set, there's not as many uh, times for that problem to occur. So definitely, I would look at something that impacts everybody or as much as everyone as possible. Mm-hmm. And then something that occurs uh, frequently, uh, uh, if not on a regular basis, definitely uh, at, at least several times a month or, or at least several times a year. Uh, and then, you know, it's, it's going to have some stickiness in terms of uh, once they build that, that traction, people are going to keep coming back for that problem to be solved. Hmm. Do you feel like, the, do you think, uh, let me rephrase my question. The market that I think of that kind of accomplishes that really well is maybe pharmaceuticals. Do you think, um, people should use models from them to kind of frame how they should approach an investor. Like these are the people I serve. This is the problem they have. And then kind of just pull from what pharmaceutical companies do in order to generate revenue. Uh, What do you mean in terms of how pharmaceuticals raise capital or? Well, how how they solve their problems, like who they're helping, like the the needs that they're, they're actually serving. You know, like, because, for example, let's say I'm on a prescription drug that I have to take once a month. Is that kind of what you mean? Like, find a problem that occurs? Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Well, that's why the pharmaceutical companies, uh, you know, make a lot of money because they're solving uh, diseases or inflictions that that require uh, the medicine uh, on a regular basis. Right. Mm-hmm. And not, not even that, but you're also saving a person's life. Uh, potentially with, with the medicine. So that's obviously, I mean, life is obviously one of probably the biggest problems a person could, could deal with. So yes, yes, definitely. The, uh, using the pharmaceutical industry as, uh, um, I wouldn't say a North star, but as an example of a a massive problem that Mm -hmm. would have a lot of frequent reoccurring use, definitely. That's what you'd want to model your, your startup after. Right. So high contact, high value, um, high engagement, <laughs> maybe even, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Engagement would would definitely be a big plus in front of any uh, angel or investor's eyes. Yeah, we we talked about that a little bit last night. Um, yeah, we did. So I'm glad that you're kind of reinforcing that idea. So I'm really happy about that, actually. 
Um, so let's move on to what investors typically look for when they're looking at financial models, right? We we kind of covered not using things like Cash App or, you know, using less traditional forms of banking or even having your financials out of order to be able to get funded ac- adequately, excuse me. So what are some financial models, but also just basic finances that should be in place in order to be an attractive prospect to a to an angel investor. Mm-hmm. Well, definitely, yeah. Well, obviously, you'd want to see uh, you know revenue. Revenue is probably mm-hmm. one of the most important metrics. You, you'd want to see revenue growing at a mm-hmm. healthy, not just annually, but but month by month. You know, right. if you're double digit monthly growth in in revenue, uh, that that's really something that that's appealing. Mm-hmm. Um, and what drives revenue for a lot of tech companies, uh, it's users. So user growth uh, and user churn or retention um, mm-hmm. is another metric uh, to look at. You know, how are the users growing? Um, and then how are they, are they staying on the platform or are they leaving? And then mm-hmm. how are they, um, you know, there, there are terms such as, you know, a weekly active user, a monthly active user, um, you know, which means, you know, the person is logging on into the app at least once a week or once a month. So definitely seeing high engagement um, right. is important. And then another thing would be comparing, comparing user growth, comparing engagement against uh, competitors um, and other, other similar uh, companies. Like if you're talking about a fintech app, you know, you could look at all, all fintech apps that you, know, you could get the data on um, that you have readily available and see how they're engaging with their user base and to see you know, is it in line with with our user engagement? Um, is it close? Is it is it greater? Or is it less? Yeah. Um, so, so that's that's um, those are probably the the two main things um, at first that I would look at from a financial perspective. But having said that, you know, the the finances are are probably less than ten or even five percent um, at the uh, you know at the early stage when you're talking about angel investing, pre seed, seed, uh, maybe even Series A. Um, the financials don't really matter as much because, again, there hasn't really been a historical uh, basis for those financials. You know, you're probably looking at financial statements of only six months, a year, maybe two years max. Right. His two years of data is not really something you can go use to project on a basis where you can have confidence in those mm-hmm. projections, right? So. Um, the finances are really a small part of it. Well, what's more important to me is understanding um, what the founder is made of. You know, how, how are they able to deal with, with obstacles? Uh, you know, what have they done in the past? Uh, uh, because really, you know, uh, most of the investment is tied up in that person's ability to execute and build what they're saying they're going to be able to build. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, more... Uh, I'm, I don't want to speak for all angel investors, but for me specifically, I definitely focus more on the individual or the founding team uh, in their past history, their past track record um, as they're going into the, the in, more than the, the, the financials. Right. Is there any way to measure that? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's pretty subjective. So it's hard to, it's hard to quantify that, but just having uh, conversations with, with, with them and understanding what's their level of confidence um, what's their ability to, to answer any and all questions or red flags that you might uh, come up with? Uh, you know, if they, they stutter around those, those issues or obstacles that you're able to envision, then mm-hmm. it, it's, hard for that, it's hard for that person to inspire confidence that they'll be able mm-hmm. to solve those mm-hmm. issues and even articulate um, in a simple way how they would go about solving yeah. them. There's that. Um, in terms of actual quantification, yeah, I mean, it definitely helps if a founder has had previous success before. Um, so, yeah, I, I often like to look for uh, two times or three times founders. Um, that's definitely something that's appealing to me because it's proven that they know what they're doing and that they've been able to take a startup from inception all the way to exit. Right. So if they've done it before uh, and, you know, probably one out of 100 of these startups you know, are able to complete that process. So the fact that they were able to, to do something that is usually a 1% success, um, that, that shows that uh, they, they know what they're doing and that, that they have a higher probability of doing it again versus someone who, who hasn't. 
Right. You know, it's, you know, I'm really happy that you mentioned um, being able to answer certain questions and how they, the response to those questions that are being asked. Um, Because what I find a lot with newer entrepreneurs, especially that maybe not, that don't have like the most solid proof of concept is that whenever you're asking questions, even, even if you're not planning on investing, just kind of trying to understand where they are as a business, they, 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 they're really resistant to answering those questions because they feel like you're attacking their business versus seeing the opportunities to actually take those questions and think about how they're going to improve on what they're doing. So I hope that didn't go over anyone's head because. No, definitely. It's a great word, attacking. That's, that's what our investors' job is to do. Yeah. We're supposed to attack, attack the business model, attack your, your, your previous history and success. And um, I guess attack might be a little bit of an aggressive word, but definitely poke holes. Um, mm-hmm. Investors poke holes through everything because, you know, at the end of the day, they they have to defend their hard earned money, right? So, uh, against multiple different opportunities that might exist, you know, there's not only just one startup that they're right. talking. To, they're always going to be talking to multiple startups, so they're going to compare this founder versus the founder of X, Y, Z. Um, uh, and so that that's definitely something that founders should be aware of. That investors are going to try to attack and poke holes through everything that you say. Mm-hmm. So you just able to again defend defend stuff it doesn't have to necessarily be right but yeah. if you can the attacks or holes logically yeah sound uh reasoning then that's sufficient enough for an investor right no that makes Whether sense investor agrees with with your solution or not if you can yeah. defend it with logic and reason that that is really what um will help said founder out yeah no that's that is Great, great insight. Thank you for that. Um, so you also mentioned a little bit earlier that, well, I mean, even to speaking to the attacking or poking holes into the idea, do you think that a SWOT, like conducting SWOT analysis on a continuous basis kind of will help mitigate some of that to look at, have the entrepreneur think about, you know, what the strengths of the business are, what the weaknesses of the business are, kind of continuing to improve on that, um, thinking about what possible threats could come up. Um, and what opportunities are available still that they maybe haven't tapped into? Should should they do that on a continual basis for someone like when approaching someone like you? Definitely, one hundred percent. Because if you're think of it, if if you're able to uh, bring up these these issues or obstacles before the investor mm. even asks them, and they happen to be some of the issues that is going to come up or are going to come up for the investor. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like you're predicting the future, right? You know, when someone is able to finish your question or sentences before you even say it, mm-hmm. uh, it really, you know, you, you become impressed by that person. So definitely having that being prepared for potential uh, questions or red flags that investors might raise will definitely help anyone. And mm-hmm. so that's why, you know, uh, you want to have as many reps as possible. How are you going to understand what, what questions might arise on a regular basis? Well, by just pitching, right. uh, every rep counts, even the ones that don't succeed or close an investment, it mm-hmm. definitely helped the founder gain more data and information about what the next pitch might look like. Mm-hmm. So for preparing, uh, I mean, obviously not to present the SWOT analysis, but just to have it in your, in mm-hmm. your mind so that you're prepared, have it in your back pocket. It'll definitely be helpful um, in terms of uh, getting ahead in, a, uh, in front of uh, the, these questions that might arise. Right. No, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, that's very valuable. And I, again, I hope that didn't go over anyone's head. <laughs> All right. So, um, so you mentioned a little bit earlier where someone might look for an angel investor, but do you have any more insight you want to offer on that? Uh, yeah, again, just try to network with, with people that are already in the space. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, anybody... That's, uh, you know, if you don't know anyone that's in VC investing, definitely start with people who are just investors in general, you know, retail trader or people who have some control over their, um, their, the investments they make, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they're what you outsource all, all of that to, you know, either a bank or a, a financial advisor, but typically a person who, who doesn't do that and is, is in control of, of their, their capital on the investment side they're more likely to, to have people within their network 
uh, that that do invest um, at the the venture capital and angel level, uh, and that that's that's a way to to get introduced to them. Um, and then again, like I said, the accelerators and the crowdfunding sites and angel list are good resources just to see what's out in the market. Um, but yeah, another way is just yeah, you just need to get your feet wet and you do one deal. If you do one deal, uh, typically you know founders know other founders, and so you're going to get used. Uh, because, because you were able to invest in one founder, uh, you know, you, you, you develop a relationship and then when his friends or the other founders that he might be in a, or she might be in an accelerator as well, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they could to all the people in their cohort in the accelerator. So yeah, definitely, um, just yeah, networking is, is probably the best way to, to sourcing deal flow. Right. No, that makes sense. Okay. So I'll, I'll make sure to leave the the list of some of the sites that you mentioned for people to be able to easily access. Um, one question that came up and comes up often when we talk about funding is what can the funds be used for? Just could you do like a brief overview of other than like operational costs, you know what I mean? Or like research and development, like what else can the funds be used for when um, being funded? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, again, that typically... Um, every business is, is different. There, there is no cookie cutter uh, breakdown of, of use of funds uh, that you could really apply. But definitely marketing is a bit, if it's, especially if it's a consumer play or a consumer tech play, uh, marketing is always uh, probably the largest portion of the, um, of the use of funds. Uh, because oftentimes the startup has built the platform and they're ready to go into beta. Uh, but they just don't have any way of, of getting that uh, the word out um, in an inorganic manner. And so to do that, you know, it's, it's easy to get organic you know, word of mouth and referrals, but that can only take you so far. So to really, you know, take it to another level, what, what they call, uh, you know, uh, throwing their gas on the fire is, is once you understand, you know, what your customer acquisition cost is to really take a big portion of what you use to, to see if, if that, customer acquisition cost is, is real um, and that you continuously acquire customers on that, uh, on that basis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that, that's definitely um, important. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you said that. Cause you know, I'm going to say this a lot, like refer to other um, pieces of content that we've done because our podcast is not traditional. Like, you know, how like you have gone guest and talk about different topics. Um, we, we do it in like a series kind of way where every month we talk about, a specific business related um, subject. And I'm watching all these pieces that kind of come together. And I've been preaching that from day one, like all these things matter. You're not, business doesn't kind of work in like a little monolith. Like you don't just have one thing. And then once you do that one thing, you're going to take off. You talked about customer acquisition costs and understanding those costs. We just did a whole series on pricing and how, so really understanding how those things will play into even being funded and what you're going to use that funding for, the pricing is going to come in. It's going to come into play at some point, right? So I'm really happy you said that. <laughs> um, well, yeah, a customer acquisition cost, I could imagine being one of the most, um, or maybe even employment um, employees or staff or key staff mm -hmm. as far as helping the product be forward. On, it is going back to the tech example. If you're building a tech platform, um, it, depending on the stage of where you're at, uh, if it's still pre product, uh, then most of your investment is going to go into hiring the, the relevant uh, engineers and developers, finding a CTO uh, that you pay to, to build the product and then to, to maintain it um, going forward so that there aren't any bugs or too many issues uh, as you scale and get more users. Right. Uh, so definitely yeah, marketing and, and uh, yeah, engineering development would probably be two, two big ones. Uh, for non-tech plays, um, you know, like consumer goods, uh, a lot of uh, the, the use of funds go to inventory uh, mm -hmm. or, or to finance your know, purchase orders. Sometimes these, these brands will have, um, you know, a purchase order from a retailer and, and, but they don't have the capital to, to fund the, the inventory. Right. So yeah. um, if it's not tech, yeah, that's what, that's usually a main bucket that, that you would see uh, get a lot of the spend attributed to. Right, right. So you know, you know what that made me think of when you said that Shark Tank, how like they'll sit and they'll ask the the business owner questions about like where they are in their business. 
like what they're actually going to be using the funds for. Um, and then how, when they acquire the funds, it's going to impact their business. Um, do you like that show at all? Oh uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Good. Would uh, you recommend that as like required learning? <laughs> oh yeah. Like for a person who doesn't have any uh, investing experience whatsoever, definitely. Uh, Cause I think the questions that the sharks ask um, are good material. They're good data points mm-hmm. uh, for a founder to, again, like I said, prepare themselves for what, what red flags, what obstacles might uh, occur on a pitch. And yeah. like I said, you know, every rep counts. You could almost count each of those um, segments as maybe not a full rep, but uh, definitely a half rep, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, you're going to be obtaining more information. You're going to understand more of the, the language that mm-hmm. they use. You'll, you'll be definitely prepared. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't use all of, I wouldn't say Shark Tank is all you need to, to understand and prepare for a pitch, but it's definitely, if you don't have the experience, it's definitely uh, one way to get your feet wet. Okay. What other resources are there? Book recommendations, maybe podcast, other than ours, of course, um, <laughs> podcast and other yeah. um, materials that you think people who are going to look or walk down the investment route should consider engaging with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. The you know any podcast you can find that uh, that specializes on on venture capital or angel investing. Um, is definitely something you want to listen to. They're, um, they're definitely going to be talking about the things that you want to get familiar with. Mm-hmm. And to. Um, another big resource is, is like a, going back to the accelerators. Um, you can think of accelerators as almost like a, an executive uh, MBA or an executive boot camp for yeah. founders who don't have that, that experience. Um, it's not really for something for a founder who's already on his or her second or third startup because uh, they've already gotten their feet wet they've done it before it's not their first rodeo but for people who are just starting out um, the accelerators are a good place to to build up uh, everything you need to to go to market and, and raise capital and a lot of them also uh, provide um, your first check yeah uh, antler antler writes a 200k or 150 to 200k check um, yc and Techstars, i believe it's 150 thousand also um, mm-hmm. 100 200 so uh, not only can you learn, but sometimes about, I think, 10 or 20 percent of their students uh, successfully raise funding directly from the accelerator. So they're a good resource that I would I would tell any founder who thinks they're not ready to raise financing to go look into. Yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely be sure to um, tag them. OK, so I have two more questions and I'm not going to bother you anymore. <laughs> OK. All right. So just walk us through an investor's mindset regarding um, how they plan what, when they're looking at like a proposal or a pitch deck, how they want to see risk managed. Risk mm-hmm. in terms of what sense, how, I mean, cause there's, I mean, at the pre-seed seed level, uh, it's there, there, there's just too much risk, right? Um, when one out of, or nine out of 10 of these fail, that that is the risk, um, right. that kind of these, investment, if you made a portfolio of 10 startups on average, nine out of 10 w- would fail. So that risk is, is just present um, at all times. So mm-hmm. I, you don't, I, I can't speak for other investors, but for me personally, it's not really something I think about. I think more about, you know, again, like what is the, this person trying to solve and does he or she have the requisite experience and mindset, confidence and mentality and team around them to be able to execute uh, this solution uh, properly on large scale. Uh, if, if, if you find a team that you really believe in, uh, that, that's really the risk mitigant, right? You, you're, you, you're able to say that I believe that these people are going to be able to overcome this startup risk, this 90% failure rate uh, because of you know whatever it is that triggered it for you. But yeah, so yeah, for me, I'm not really looking at, at risk um, at that, at that, on a micro level, definitely you can take a look at risk at a macro level. Uh, you know, in this environment we're in right now, you know, with the, the Nasdaq down fifty percent from from its peak, and uh, valuations just down, uh, uh, all of them regularly. Um, one way to risk manage as an investor is to definitely start tightening the belt a little bit, uh, not making as many investments 
um, in, in this environment. So yeah, that definitely risk management at the macro level is important to me. But on the micro level, um, I don't really think about it because it's just, to me, it's already just assumed that this is a, very, a highly risky proposition to begin with. Okay. Um, so how do you become that number 10 that's not, that actually succeeds? Like what, what have you seen consistently that, I mean, I mean, I guess I'm ans- asking a question you've already answered, essentially that those, those key indicators that this is going to be someone who's going to walk through this and achieve some form of success because they're determined to essentially. Yeah. Yeah. A that a, like I said, uh, have they done it before? Have they right. done it before? He risks it a lot for me, as it should for investors. Um, and then just, yeah, looking at the, the growth. If, if the product is already out there, uh, what does the growth look like? Is it, is it continuously trending upwards um, on a basic basis? Or is it starting to flatten out? Um, and so uh, is that, are they going to be able to continue to deliver that kind of growth? And uh, again, that, that, Part of that's on the founder, but a part of that's also in what industry and and what uh, or what sector they're they're um, operating in specifically. Um, so you know they're they're both those factors. Um, but yeah, I mean to be number ten, I mean a lot of it also just comes down to, to luck and and being in the uh, the right place at the right time. Yeah. Um, and so that that's a portion that an investor can't really again quantify or put a figure on, or even explain, because that, that just happens to be, uh, you know, you're either, you either happen to be in, in the right place at the right time or, or you're not. Right. Uh, so, but yeah, about, apart from luck, yeah, just having the mentality uh, that this person's not gonna give up, that, that they can creatively think of solutions, because a lot of problems that don't typically come up in your regular nine to five or your regular corporate job, those, uh, in an existing business that's been going on for years, right? Those problems don't typically arise uh, at the startup level. So, a person who's able to take challenges and to and and obstacles with a positive mentality and not let not beat themselves up over it or not let it uh, detract from what they're trying to do, that's really important to me. You know how a founder deals with um, with negativity and and with with problems because the, it's the, uh, a constant uh, uh, daily uh, action, you know, solving problems. Uh, it's just as a startup founder, you're constantly going to be putting out fires um, right. on a daily. So that's really big. And, you know, how do you deal with the fire? That's fair. So last question, and I promise we're going to go for real. <laughs> okay. Um, so you said what? It's all good. I'm having fun. Okay, good, good. But th- but this really is unfortunately the last question. <laughs> um, so Project Diane recently came out with an article, recently being like February, that stated like as of 2022, well, 2020, $125,000 went to um, minority-owned women businesses, like spe- specifically women businesses. And I just don't understand why that number is so low when like the national average is about like two and a half million, Right. And there's also another big discrepancy because we're seeing women-led businesses, especially from the minority group, growing so fast, right? Why, why and how do we close that gap? Definitely. Um, well, there's a, there's a big uh, proliferance of, of funds now, VC funds, uh, family offices that specifically only look to invest in, in underrepresented uh, founders, minorities, um, women-owned businesses. So definitely those, those places are, are a good starting point. I mean, going back to when we were talking about how would you approach investors, right? It's all about your personal network. Um, and where does most of the, I mean, not to make generalizations, but where does you know, most of the, the pockets of wealth uh, lie, right? It's with older, uh, wealthy, uh, white males. Right. And so that's why VC, if you look at uh, a lot of VC funds, that's what the, their roster of investors looks like. And mm-hmm. uh, so naturally, um, it, it's going to be harder for, for uh, minority founders to tap those, uh, those silos. Our VC is a very siloed um, industry. Right. And so it's hard 
yeah, luckily, uh, you know, that there are, are funds that are starting to come up and, and focus on that. You know, Harlem Capital is a real big one. Um, so just getting involved there, trying to network with, with those funds, um, trying to meet the, the GPs at those um, underrepresented minority focused uh, VCs. And th- there's a good number of them now. Right? And I only believe it's going to continue to grow um, because, you know, as an underrepresented section of VC, well, you know, when you say underrepresented to an investor, that means that there's an opportunity there, right? Because there's a lack of coverage. So yeah. I only think it's going to get better. Um, and I think, you know, 10, 15 years, um, hopefully not that long, but we're going to start to see th- those figures of, of women and minority founders getting more investment uh, rise. Mm, good. Okay, good. I'm hopeful about that too. Um, I actually just thought of one more thing. <laughs> so I'm a liar. Okay. Um, so listen, one more thing. Um, you're, as an angel investor, there's a lot of risk. You said nine out of 10 businesses um, don't work out, right? Um, you've also mentioned that there's a lot of um, pretty much gut feeling and intuition that goes into it when you're engaging with a VC, with a potential company that you might want to fund, but there's no real way to quantify whether that business owner is going to be successful or not. You're just kind of like back of the napkin, having conversations and trying to feel them out. Um, With so much risk involved on your part, what's the incentive for you to give away a dollar at all, right? What's the bonus for you? Is there like a tax write-off? Is there like like, how does this work for the investor that they, other than like a business that does take off, they will get their return on their investment, right? Clearly. Well, that, yeah, that's the hope, right? I mean, the VC returns are, are nothing like the, the public market returns, you know, where 100, 200% on a stock, uh, an investor or a public trader would, would be ecstatic with. Um, in the VC side, 100, 200% is not going to cut it. Uh, you know, the, um, I'm looking for opportunities that are going to go, uh, you know, 30 to, to 50 X, uh, what, what I invested in. And so the hope is, you know, if you do, um, 10, 20 of these, one of them is going to return significant, you know, that 30 to 50 X return that you're looking for. And that will more than compensate all of the other losses, um, that you incurred to, to do that. Mm-hmm. And so then the BC returns are, are, are really, um, high, are, uh, because obviously the risk is, is much higher. Um, than, than markets so right. yeah the, you know, I, I do 10 the one that does work out or the two to get lucky and two work out you're really looking that those um w- will cover all of the the previous investments you made um in 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 that group or subset that you chose to invest in at the same time and that return is is definitely much higher than what you could get in in the public markets um investing in stocks mm-hmm. no that makes sense so if you were so if you were to lose, like, let's say 10 out of 10 didn't work, is there like a, an advantage tax-wise or in any other way that benefits you? Oh, yeah, yeah. If you lose, yeah, it's, uh, you, can, you can write off the investments against any gains you have on other mm-hmm. investments. Okay. If you have a business or you invest in the public markets, any losses you have in venture capitalists, just like any other investment. Or if you, yeah, if you have gains from crypto, you can write off any gains um with the losses from venture capital gotcha okay awesome well jose thank you so much i learned a lot um i know anyone engaging and listening will also learn a lot we're going to leave all of the resources that you mentioned in the show notes we're also going to leave your contact information in the show notes but just for the sake of um i guess repetition could you just let us know if we wanted to find you where we would how to get in contact i know you don't want cold emails but if yeah. we wanted to get in contact with you yeah, how would you do that the, um the best place is linkedin it's the only social media um account that i have but yeah um you can find me on linkedin uh, i go by um tino reyes there it's just short for jose florentino so you can find me on linkedin tino reyes um my uh, my title is um angel investor and startup advisor or startup consultant. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jose. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Natalie. You have a good one. Hold on one second.
All right, we're no longer live. Okay, let me just also turn off the recording. Thank you so much for listening to the Mental Money Podcast. Please go ahead and remember to subscribe, but don't hoard all of this good information for yourself. Share this information with someone that you know could use it, especially if they need a shift in their mindset or someone who would love to have more money. So until we meet again, remember, like Uncle Snoop said, keep your mind on your money and your money on your mind.